All right. Isaiah 59 9 is where we'll start, and I'll read it. Um, Isaiah 59. Last week, talked about anger, didn't we not? Yes, we did. Thank you. Thank you for that. If you said something different, I'd have been confused from the start. <laughs> Isaiah 59 9 says, Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, there's darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. What kind of emotion comes up out of that passage right there? Disappointment. Disappointment. Sadness. Sadness. Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Feels kind of heavy and closed in and... I like the word disappointment for what we're going to talk about today. The sadness and and all those emotions are certainly present. That word gloom right there at the end is certainly, here y'all go, kind of gives the gist. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah. You know, we hope and hope and hope for things to turn out a certain way. We fight and we fight for things for our world, our life to go a certain way, or for to be healthy, or whatever, whatever. But we fight and fight and fight, and things don't change. They don't get better. And then one day runs into another, and another, and another, and it all becomes mundane, heavy, and we strive. We what's that saying? Tedious. Tedious. Good word. We believe, we believe, we believe the promises of God and, and we lean into them and we pray and we pray things would be different. I'd feel better. This situation would turn out a certain way. That my marriage would be better. My children, whatever. Things would change and be different and we pray and we pray and nothing happens. It doesn't even change. And eventually, our hope to feel better or the situation to change, our hope fades away. We don't even notice it. Our hope just, poof, it fades away. This becomes our reality. This becomes gloom. It becomes disappointment. And it closes us in and it wraps its arms around us. And we think... Is this all there is? This is all there is. This is what I'm left with. Gloom. Sadness. Disappointment. Let's look at disappointment today. And how that can uh, overwhelm us and overpower us. And uh, take our joy from us, obviously. So let's look at that. I'd ask you uh, to think with me for a minute. What is it? What is it in our world? What are typical things? This is no gotcha or anything. What kind of things do we hope for as we go along in our life? What, what, what kind of things do we, we hope for? We to win the World Series. For the... I've waited all my lifetime for that. You're disappointed. <laughs> exactly. Every year. That's what I say. Don't make me write Cleveland is to win the World Series. All right. I was going to add then the Detroit Lions winning the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is going where I, I didn't see it. I didn't see it going this way. Hey, right? Uh-huh. Health. Yeah. Health. Thank you, Heath, for digging me up. Back on lock. <laughs> what do we hope for with health? It's easy. What do we hope? What do we hope for? Good health. I hope to have good health all my life, to stay strong all the days I'm on the earth. Right? Feel well. Right. What else about health? There's, there's maybe another side of it. What, if, Dottie? What are you hoping for in regards to your health? No back pain. To no back pain. To feel better. Yeah. Right? 
We hope our health is good all our life, but as is common, we get sick. We hope, we hope it goes, works through our body quickly, or if it's of a chronic nature, that it gets sorted out. And we no longer have back pain. And you have soldiered on for a long time. Yeah. All right, so hell, what else do we hope for? Our children to love the Lord. Our children and their salvation. Our children, let's just put that as a heading, salvation. What else do we hope for in regards to our children? For their help. For their help, that the be well. What else? A lot of us have got grown children. They'll be joyful and find work. Prosperous. Happy. There's a lot there. Yeah. Prosperous. Happy, prosperous. You said something else there. You got away from me. But, but, but yeah, we have all these as parents. That they have a garage apartment for when we're old. <laughs> that they plan. That they plan for us. That they incorporate us into their. Plans. That brings up another thing. One of our hopes is that we'll be taken care of when we are old. There's another one for our own. I'll just put here old age. We hope that we have saved enough, healthy enough to enjoy it. You know, that is a new thing to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I missed it. Is this class depressing you? <laughs> I missed something. <laughs> no, go ahead. You're not about old age. Yeah, about old age? No, that's going to be the best year. A lot of those things. You know, I'm hoping for children. Yeah. We, we, uh, what are some other things? Well, in, just in general, when, when things aren't exactly the way we, we want them, we hope that things will get better. We hope things get better. That, that, that's of a, a general nature. Whatever they are, just that they continue to be better. Yeah. Hope to be faithful in the midst of... Spiritual concerns, right? Yeah. That I, that I become more spiritual. Means a lot of things. Help to retire. Don't what do we what do we hope for in our marriages? Good loving relationship. Marriage, loving. I didn't I don't think I spelled it right, but that it's loving, that it's filled with love and and um, camaraderie and happiness. Bliss. I mean, that's what we really do hope for. Children. Children. There we go. We hope for children. That it's long. As long as, it's, long as the Lord ordains it, that it is wonderful. Um, what about work? What are we hoping for with work? Retire one day. <laughs> Retire. It's like the third time I've heard of that. See the average age of folks in this room. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, Jan. I'm sorry, I'm speaking for myself, not my husband. You'll work forever. That clear. I'm with you. The Lord takes him home. Four years, two months. So, <laughs> I'd say meaningful work. Okay, good. Uh, that, that's meaningful, but it doesn't feel like work. For a promotion, there, that's real relevant. Yeah. That I get promoted, moved up. Um, children recovered, retirement. Find a spouse. spouse. Huh? Find a spouse. What? <laughs> to be married. <laughs> yeah. There's just we plucked, we did real good. There's just. All these things that we hope for as we go through our life over the course of our life, the things that Rebecca and Sarah hope from, hope for, are going to naturally, some will match ours, and, the, and then in a lot of cases they'll be different. Work. I want to retire. Work. I want to get promoted. You know, I want to I want to get a job that I can get promoted at. You know, that it, over the course of our life. The things we hope for ebb and flow, move in and out, they change. 
But for some of for some of us, our hopes don't come together the way we imagined that they would, and we can kind of adjust to that. Eh, I'll, it's okay. I didn't get that promotion. This is I kind of topped out in this industry. It's okay. You know, I, I'll I'll go I'll move along until it's time to retire. Just as an example. You get what I'm saying? We just adjust. <clears throat> or we change our expectations. But some others of us, when things don't work out the way we hoped and prayed and worked, uh, strove on, strove forward, put our time, effort, sweat into it, for some of us, when these things fall short, we see that disappointment as hope extinguished. We had hope. I had hope that I, that my old age I'd get to retire at 62, and then I can't, and all hope for something to happen is extinguished. Without hope, though, this is the thought, without hope, there is no future. We get stuck right here today with all the gloom, right? Without hope, there is no future. Just that sadness and disappointment, that gloom that settled on us. We don't look out and about and think, well, tomorrow's another day. You know, God, you know, you give my mind now, everything becomes present and heavy. So let's ask now, how, how does hope die? Put your thinking caps on. What kind of things happen in our life that cause hope to die? Unanswered prayers. Unanswered prayers. Mm -hmm. Things I, I hope for, I pray for. I want to go with that. Un, I got to think how to spell this. Unanswered prayer. Unanswered prayer. And we pray and we don't get what we believe we needed. And it might be valid. I want to have a good freshman year at college. And I want to get all A's. Right? And I want to get I want, or I want to get in this special program or I want to get that promotion when it comes around. We we pray for it, and we pray for it, and we pray for it, and we don't get we we don't believe we do not get what we believed we needed, and what we worked so hard for. So unanswered prayer, not getting what I think I need. There's how there's one way that hope can die for an individual. What's another? I think just not being able to see how things will get better, or just where you're. Your, your focus is all on the negative and what can go wrong and, and just like a downward spiral. Becoming hopeless, not being able to see out there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Anybody got another shot? I got well, look, the very first thing. Oh, we get a bad night, bad diagnosis. We get a bad, a, 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 a singular devastating event happens in our life. Something that, you know, we're hoping life is going to, we think it's going to unfold one way, or this is what this thing is going to go, this thing in our life, and then a singular, devastating disappointment occurs. A diagnosis of cancer. We'll fit right there. The death of a child or a spouse. Right? I mean, that is singular and devastating. Had everything worked out here, and our spouse dies. Changes everything. Hope dies for some. So I sing a devastating, devastating disappointment. Event. Okay? Another one? Somebody else? Huh? I did the opposite of that where it's a repeat of the same event. Yes. One time's okay. You saw my notice. Good. Three times I'm done, right? Yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever you see with this. Yeah, what, what, but they're, these aren't little things. These are big things that happen, right? Right, but these are more minor, medium, not the one singular, but the 
multiple disappointments. Some of them might not be on the scale of losing a spouse, I think is which, but nonetheless, the hits just keep on coming. That's the point. That's the one I wanted. Thank you. It's a rich rock and roll pass. <laughs> yes, sir. Another one. Not that even be big things. Could be just little things stacking up. Yeah, I think that's what he's saying. It, it, it could be some couple of big things, or a big thing, some little things, or a bunch of little things. But after a while, it's just wow. I'm overwhelmed by it. And the other one I put up here is trauma, which can be many different things to all of us. But trauma it always is painful. And whenever we remember or are reminded of the traumatic event, we go back to it. And, and for some, it's like you're there again. For some, the pain becomes overwhelming again. It's just, there's all manner of ways it can manifest itself. But after a while, hope dies. When will I be able to? To assimilate this. I will, I will never be the same, is the, is the fear. And hope does. I think for all of us, in some way or another, we've encountered things like this. And we've gone through a season of our life where the disappointment is just heavy and hard. With, it's different for all of us. Hope is tied up in the future. And hope, hope is the future, our children, our spiritual life, our marriage, our work. Hope is the future reaching back to the present. When we hope for something, we're looking out there to get somewhere, and it's reaching back to motivate us and move us and touch us and it just gets us going. Yes! I got four years and two months to go and I'll have made it. Right? Hope is the future reaching back to the present. And when hope is dead and disappointment prevails, there's no longer any reason to get out of bed or to hope for something else or to aspire for anything, because I'm just going to get knocked back on my heels. No reason to get out of bed, or go to work, or to love, be passionate. In fact, the death of hope is so horrible, one some must put up defenses to keep from getting hurt again. And slowly but surely, just step back in the home and just stay away from the rest of the world. Just fade away. Because if I go out in the world and become vulnerable, I'll get disappointed. The gloom wins. Um, any comments, anybody? I think we've all been there one time or another in our life. Maybe not to the extreme I, I, I put it out to, but we've all been disappointed and hurt. And it stuck with us a little bit. I think sometimes, like, when you do have that pinnacle that you're looking for, and you get there, and it's not what you thought it was going to be, mm. you know, like, you, you put all this into retirement or into whatever, marriage or having a child and blah, 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 whatever, a job, and it's not quite as big as you made it, and yeah. you're disappointed because, wow, this is what I was living for. Is this all there is? This didn't add up. This wasn't what I thought it was going to turn into. Very good. Very good. I, uh, we discussed, we are discussing disappointment after anger because in reality they are somewhat related. Uh, you hope and hope for something, marriage, relationships, raises, whatever it might be, and they don't come true. And then as they don't get true some, for some, we get frustrated, and if we can pin our pain on someone, we will. It's his fault that I didn't get that promotion. That guy uh, did this and did that, and it's not true, and I didn't get that promotion. Uh, you know, if we can find a way to shift our pain to someone else, and our disappointment to someone else, we will. 
And that will often look like anger, aggravation. Um, if we can't find a person to blame, though, we can't project this disappointment on someone else, then all of the, what's left? Me. That's just, I, there's something wrong with me. And actually, we won't like that. We'll say, no, nope, God is against me. God just doesn't care about my circumstances. God is, is doing something to me that it's unknowable and it's mean and he's a conspirator against me. And then as we nurture our pain and wallow in the disappointment, we slowly, just like a moment ago I described, we withdraw from the world, from our friends, from church. We will eventually move away from God. God's not doing anything for what I hope for. I keep praying and nothing happens. Um, we'll stop with regular worship. We'll pray less and less. Some will turn to alcohol and drugs, push away the pain because the pain and disappointment is too much, or they'll turn to risky behaviors, sleep too much, any manner of things, because that gloom is too much to bear. Turn with me to the book of Jonah. Chapter 4. Jonah, he needs to be a bigger book because I just missed it in this Bible. Jonah chapter 4. Someone read for me the first three verses. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Thank you. Boy, Jonah's like Daddy Down here, isn't he? Doesn't Jonah kind of sound depressed? What was Jonah hoping for? Destruction of Nineveh. Huh? Destruction of Nineveh. Go get go, go, hurt something else. Yes. He wanted his way. And he wanted the destruction of Nineveh. He wanted judgment on the Assyrians. Uh, here, here's this other country. Oh, they've always been mean to us. You're our God. Of course you'll avenge us and uh, go after him. Jonah knew what he hoped for. Uh, he hoped for Israel's enemies to be judged. It's not unlike us in some ways, unfortunately. And instead, God sent him to go preach to the very people he hoped would God, that God would kill. He And, and kind of said, go preach to them so that they'll repent. And Jonah, as we know the story goes, said, no, nah, I'm not going with that plan. I got, a, I got my own plan. And off he goes. Why, why did Jonah run, perhaps? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons, but let's, let's flesh them out. Why did, why did Jonah run? To escape. To escape from having to do what he wanted to do. That's another reason. Didn't want to be any part of that. God, your plan is no good for me. No, no, no. My hope is that if you blow those guys up. Jonah knew that God was merciful, didn't he? Jonah knew that his God, our God, was full of mercy. And that if he's sending me to preach to these guys, he's intending... To be merciful. And he does it, as you said. I don't want to be a part of any of that. Matter of fact, what's it say? He was displeased exceedingly, right? And angry. Can you just see him seething? You know, as he's heading there to the harbor, getting the boat to go out there, all that going on. He's probably just pouting 
and he's sad, displeased. In verse 3, let's see, let me go backwards. Uh, so you see in verses 1 and 2 his unmet expectations, right? This is what I wanted. This is what you gave me. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Um, I knew that you are a generous God and mercy. So he, his expectations for judgment were not met. Anger. We talked about anger last week. Self-pity comes up later in our discussions. Feeling sorry. That's verse 3. Uh, oh Lord, please just take my life. It's not worth it. Just trying to project his sadness. Be a little dramatic. A lot dramatic. Um, and then thoughts of death. I should die. It's not worth living. That's depression. So what can we learn from Jonah about disappointment? We see, we see it in here. We get a feel for it. And we, we recognize some of it in our life, things, the way things have worked in our life. But what can we learn about disappointment? I'll throw it out there. And let's see. Um, first is that, um, what, God is big, eh? How do we learn? What, what does this say about God and that He is big? Purposes are far beyond ours. Yeah, he's God's God's way in front of us. God, God is big, 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 big. Uh, the book, this book of Jonah, portrays how big God is. Prior to Jonah, uh, God was the God of Israel only. That's why the Israelites thought this, this is ours. And uh, here he's telling Jonah to go to the Assyrians and preach to them be a missionary, so to speak, actually. And as Bob said, God is bigger than how we imagine or define Him to be. He's got it all worked out, to put it uh, in my simple terms. And we need, to get it out of, we need to get out of our head when we become disappointed and, look, and we kind of get all closed in and my world's coming apart and it's all about me, and it is. Kind of, you know, we, we get there, and we close up, and as we close up, we need to, instead of saying, God is not in this, we need to say, where is God in this, and look for Him. God is in the details. He is in every moment of our life. God is working in our life every moment of it. Uh, so we need to get out of our head and look for what God is doing through us, with us, or to us. God does not allow adversity to come into our life without there being some holy purpose. All about your sanctification. What? It's kind of amazing. I mean, you see how big God is. You see how big Jonah's pride was. I mean, to, to look at what he's already been through. He's been thrown into the seal, been into the sea, yeah. swallowed, delivered. You'd think there would be a change in attitude there. One would think. But, uh, yeah. you know, Jonah was, <laughs> Jonah was a hard case. Jonah was a hard case. I think it gives me hope to knowing that things like this happen to people that God chose to put in his book. Oh, wow. Yeah. They, okay, wow. <laughs> they, when these things happen to our life, God chose us and for these things to occur. And Jonah, that's a big story there, but even me, in my little life, and I don't mean that, but in my life, when things happen, there's a it's part of the bigger story. He chose me for that adversity. Is that what you're saying? I was also referring to the fact that he chose that for Jonah and he wrote a story about it. For us to learn from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's cool. Thanks, Jim. Second lessons that week uh, from Jonah about disappointment, disappointment is that God is good. How do we see that God is good despite our, our disappointment? We see that God is good in that in this in these four chapters. How do we? What is there to tell us that God is good? Nineveh was not 
not destroy. He had mercy on them. He had mercy on them. He had mercy on Jonah, in a sense. He didn't destroy Jonah for, for being disrespectful. He even had mercy on the cow. On, on the what? He, said he's, he yeah. had mercy on the cow. Yes. In, in the last verse. Yeah. yeah. And also much cow. Yeah. Good point. God is good. And there's all these dis attributes and, you know, that we learn to describe the character of God. He's sovereign. He's holy. He's uh, uh, omniscient, omnipresent, so on and so forth. Not, we, we learn about all these attributes. But the one is that He is good. That means so much. And Jonah knew it. And yet despite knowing it, getting back to that kernel of truth, instead of going, oh, what's going on here? Give it, God is good. Okay, God's got a big plan for the Assyrians. Let me get on board with it. Instead, he stuck with himself. Yet despite knowing that God is good, um, he wanted God to do his bidding. Wait a minute, God. I want you to do what I want you to do. Which was not good. Jonah wanted the Assyrians destroyed. Unless you may be proud of your thought that was he went to preach 40 days and then it should be destroyed. So I think, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You guys are going to get it. <laughs> and then they repented. <laughs> Wait, he said. Uh, we can be the same way in this. Uh, we agree that God loves us, but we want to dictate the terms that he shows his love to us. And all these things right here, these things... You know, and these are not bad things, but we describe, well, here's what retirement will look like, or here's, here's the jobs my kids will have. They'll grow up to be doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs. And we hope, we hope and hope and hope for these things and pray and pray and pray for these things. And when God's plan becomes evident, well, wait a minute, that's not what I prayed for. We don't get on board with what God is wanting or what God is doing. Um, we want to dictate the terms. We want love, but we want Mr. Right to love us. We want shelter and food, but we get disappointed if we can't retire the way we want to retire. Um, we want help, but become impatient when healing is not immediate. We dic I want to be healed right now. Well, that is maybe not God's plan for you yet. So the way through this conundrum is uh, confession. Um, this conundrum of not seeing that God is good and not seeking to get on board. Not looking for where is God in all this. Um, when our ways uh, depart from God's ways and we allow ourselves to circle the drain and get caught up in dis disappointment, we need to know we need to notice that we have fallen for idolatry. Either we're, we're putting ourselves in the middle or we're putting our children at the, at, at, at the middle. We're putting a, the idea of retirement a, a, as, a, as a God to be worshipped or we're putting our work as an idol. But when our disappointment becomes so overwhelming because we didn't get something we thought we needed and we start backing away from God, I suggest that we have made that an idol. And we know how damaging and dangerous that is. Um, we need to, we can, we can notice that we are doing it um, when we notice a change in our demeanor. We become sulking, pouting, irritable, sad, depressed, of course. Ideas, thoughts of, don't I deserve to be comfortable? Don't I deserve to be loved? Don't my children deserve this or that? Don't I deserve the respect of my church or the respect of the people I work with? When we get in those thoughts, don't I? Well, we, we, we're, we're in an area we don't need to be in, spiritually. We need to repent of it and confess it. Uh, Jonah kind of thought he had a right to be angry, didn't he? You know, and, and what, did, what did God say to him about his anger? Not so fast, fish bro. <laughs> fish bro. That's good. Have you been thinking that? Oh, I've been thinking about that for the last half hour. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for that perfect Just time. waiting for the way you yeah. have. Not so fast, fish bro. 
And I'm going to totally use that one day. <laughs> totally. What did God say to him about his anger? About his anger? Verse 4, I think. You don't have good reason. Do you have a good reason to be angry? I mean, he, the Lord is looking, if you think about this way, He's looking to reason with Jonah for a minute there. He, he's not, I'm going to blast you right here, Jonah. Or I'm not, He's not going to ignore Jonah. He's looking, did you have, what is this anger about Jonah? He's looking to reason with him in prayer, meditation, Scripture. Think about this, Jonah. Do you have a right to be angry? Jonah thought he had, but the Lord's asked him to look at that. When everything seems stacked up against you, ask that question then. Do I have a right to be angry? Frustrated? Disappointed? Do I have a right to that? No. Um, God told Jonah what he wanted to say. And then when the time came, he asked Jonah the same question. And in the end, he explained to Jonah his concern for the Assyrians. The, I have a concern for the Assyrians, and I want them to repent. But he loved them. When we are disappointed and angry, we should ask ourselves the same question and be honest with ourselves about it. Do I have a right to this? And if we believe we are within our rights, go to God and tell Him, then listen for Him to reason with you. Because He will. Pray it back to Him. Listen. To what he's telling you. Because he loves you. And finally, when we become disappointed uh, and lose hope for our future, let's look at God's promises. Open up our Bibles, and there we will find scriptures that can help us by looking at God's promises stir up that hope again. Often we want what we want, and when we don't get it, we close up and around ourselves. Um, like Jonah on a hill. We want to wallow in it instead of doing something like that. When we feel disappointment, frustration, that needs to send the, clang, the, the clanging off in your mind, I need to move away from this. I need to do something. Some of these passages, uh, this, let's look at these. we got a couple of minutes. Hebrews 13.5. Let's look at these and how they can help dispel disappointment. Hebrews 13.5, someone? And if someone would get ahead and go to 1 Corinthians 10.13. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you. When disappointment, dismay, despair, overwhelm us and we believe that we're not being heard, God is promising right there to never leave us. Our dark heart, our mind, may want to, Satan may want us to believe otherwise, but God promises to never leave us. He is working something in our life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No so, temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Thank you. Like you, I also, we wrestle with sin. And we become disappointed when sin doesn't disappear from our lives. I keep wrestling with the same sin. Won't this ever go away? And we fight and we work and we pray and we repent. We, we, we strive hard against that sin to kill it and we do it again. I have no hope. I, I can't overcome this. I, 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 I'm, in an over, it can overwhelm some folks. Here's a promise that from every temptation God will, somewhere in there, provide a way out of it. No temptations overcoming is not common to man. He will never put you in a situation where a sinful response is the only way out. Oh, Philippians 1 6. Somebody got that? You who has begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
God bestows and gives more and more grace as we battle with sin. We can be optimistic as we battle sin in our life, to kill sin, that we will move forward in our battle if we are faithful in our confession, repentance, and our fight to not become disappointed and quit. We can be optimistic that next week, speaking metaphorically, as we go forward, God will give us more grace. We will love more next. We will love each other more next week than we have this week. Our love will grow. We belong to Christ. He's working in us. We are changing. We will love more next week. But we need to look, examine, and see, see what's going on. Um, Romans ten twenty. And Isaiah is so bold as to say, "I have been found by those who did not seek me." I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Thank you. God will easily be found by those who seek Him. And so often when the gloom closes in on us, we stop with, with our morning devotions and our daily Bible readings and praying for others. It gets We become so disappointed, we stop doing... We stop tending to the means of grace that we've been provided. Uh, and we stop the very thing that is going to help us get hope. Uh, he will be found by those who seek Him. Uh, John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that He be bear more, more true, so, so shall He be my disciples. Thank you. Yep. God will make us fruitful. We feel that we are lost and unloved and unuseful, not of any value. But God, as we seek Him, where He is found in the Word, He will make us fruitful as we abide in Him. Finally, Ephesians 1.11 Ephesians 1. Thank you. In Him we obtain an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. God's purposes for your life will not be thwarted. I mean, He is the one, He is the author. He is the one who's, who's, who's put it all in motion. God's purposes for Jonah were not thwarted. Matter of fact, I venture to say Jonah benefited from all that. It doesn't say what happened, but I think, and I hope, Jonah got the purpose of that message. He had no right to be angry. And that God was graceful to him. And full of grace towards him. God's purposes for your life will not be for you. We can take great hope 